brothers do you recall when the grasslands reach to the horizon? And the deafening roar of countless wings overhead. Back when Rome was a village at Britain, the Emerald Island. Before we gave up on our future and buried our dead. Episode 50. Dagestan. Uh, Dagestan is an independent republic that is lo located within the Russian Federation. And it is uh, probably not a place a lot of people here know about. That's why I wanted to talk about. Now, this is going to be really less of a uh, historical episode and more of an ethnographic one, because Dagestani region has 14 officially recognized state languages. It has, I believe, something along like uh, 104 different eth ethnic groups there. Uh, and it is a territory, let me pull up a map, that is not very large. So if we look, I mean, you know, the Caucasus is much bigger than this, obviously. But this area right here, this is the Chechen Republic right here. This is Georgia. This is Azerbaijan. And this area right here, this little stretch, that's your Dagestan. And right here, um, it's in Russian, but I'll show you the same map in English in a second. I just, the title nations, the major nations, uh, nationalities, that uh, ethnic groups that live in that region. And I'll list them. There's the Abars, there's the Dagins, Dogs, there's the Kumak people, there's the Lesk people, there's the Kazakh people, they're ru ethnically Russian Kazakh uh, groups, Lakts people, Tabasaran people, Azerbaijan people, Nogai people, Rudu people, Sahuru people, and Aguli people. And so that's just the title largest ethnic that's groups. That's not even the 14, that's just the very biggest ones. This region has people of at least three linguistic groups. There are people of the Caucasian linguistic group, and that is the um, Naho Dagestani linguistic group peoples. There's peoples there who speak various Semitic languages, and that, that would be the, uh, there is a Jewish population, uh, a mount, they're called mountain Jews. There's people who speak Turic languages there, so actually that's four linguistic groups. There's people who speak Turic languages there, and then there's people who also speak in the, Europe, uh, in the Iranian languages there and in the European, and that would be not only the Slavs, and uh, which include Russians, uh, Ukrainians, uh, you know, other peoples uh, of uh, different ethnicities who live there, but there's also some people who speak uh, languages that are cl close to, uh, ancient, to Farsi and a lot of other languages. So just a, a quick question. Um, in other parts of the Caucasus, I know there are different groups who are not getting along well, but I, I've never heard much about conflict in Dagestan. Are the people are, are cooperating better there or just we just don't hear about it? It's because in Dagestan, these people have had many, many, many centuries to conflict with each other and they have stopped conflicting with each other mostly a long time ago. The situation with Dagestan is such, let me share with another screen with you guys. There's another, this is a map of the Caucasus as such. This is an English language. So your Dagestan is right in this area. But this uh, region right here, Grozny, that's the Chechen and Gush peoples. Uh, but Dagestani peoples are right here. And they, some of these ethnicities are split between, let's say, Azerbaijan and Dagestan. Some are split between Georgia and Dagestan. Dagestan is separated into mountainous and kind of flatlands area. And traditionally, there was a state that used to exist on that territory, a state that is very ancient, a state that ceased existing with the um, Arabic conquest of that region. And it is the state known as the uh, Caucasian Al Albania. It has nothing to do with the Albania taking place, in, you know, that we all know about and we hear about in the news. It has nothing to do with the European part. The Albania that used to exist here has ex started existing about 2,000 years before the birth of Christ and ceased existing with the Arabic, Arabic conquest, intermediately appearing and disappearing as different um, forces came and conquered this region. Just remember that there was the state known as the Great Albania in this region that is very shaky what its exact territories were. It seems like it was not a singular state. Um, it is known from the writing of some of the ancient Greek and even Roman writers 
And some of the earlier information we have about the Alba Albanian peoples is that that entire conglomeration, that state consisted of at least 26 different tribes with different languages and different cultures, but that they at some point in time united into a single kingdom ruled by one king. So it is very well advised and a lot of nationalities we will talk about, they all included in the Albanian kingdom. It's, it seems that majority of Dagestan was in fact a part of Albanian kingdom at one point in time or another, or at least were close al allies or were under its direct influence. This is the Black Sea. Uh, this is Caspian Sea. This is obviously Russian language map. So right here would have been Scythian and Sabramatian tribes. That's the modern day Russian territory. Over here would be Georgia. Armenia is right here. The state of Iberia used to be here. Kolhid, Kolhid, Kolh was over here. Miots, various other peoples here, Iberia. Um, and here is our Dagestan. Now you can, by the way, there was a, a, tri a tribe known as Kasps which the Caspian Sea is named after they are now gone as far as people can tell. But you can see how mountainous this region is. And the thing is, the reason why they think Dagestan was as it became as multi-ethnical, multi-linguistic and multi-territorial really, I mean, multicultural is because you have all these little valleys that break up the population into small little groups. That's oftentimes you have a situation when one village cannot speak the language of the neighboring village or at least they have to learn it. it's not their native language. There's two regions in this world that have such linguistic diversity. One of them is very well known to ling linguists across the world and that's uh, Papua New Guinea. The other region that is a lot less studied is this Dagestani region where the linguistic diversity is enormous. Even though a lot of these languages belong to just a few families, I mean a few, I guess you have four major <laughs> super families and then um, you have all these different uh, dialects. I'm not even going to bother to list them all because there, I think there's over 104 languages in that region. Big thing about the reason you got so many, as uh, Julie said, you do have all those mountain valleys that coming down from the Caucasus. Now the Caucasus are, they're bigger than Rockies or taller than Rockies. Um, there are significant mountain range, that north, north range particularly. It is one of three routes across the Caucasus, the, along the Caspian Sea, and it was probably the most favored route by the steppe peoples. You would have the Iranian, uh, the Persian empires uh, that were also often as they expanded and contracted uh, going there. So the strange thing, genetic studies say that the, the fact that somebody speaks a particular language may be that they have adapted the language instead. For example, it's speculated that some of the populations is uh, genetically they're probably related to um, Persian groups like the Medes. It's a very, it's, a, it's geography because of that, that passage through east end of the Caucasus. Um, there's one in the central, there's another pass in the central section and there's one on the Black Sea side but that was probably for the steppe peoples who kept coming out of the Alte for 2,000 years, 2,500 years, they were there and when they expanded and went to raid the, in uh, either Roman Armenia or, or Armenia or wherever, or the Persian empires, they tended to go through there and they left remnants of all those various peoples. And David is onto something here. Can you guys hear me? So, and we will, as we go, because the way that I decided to structure this, because it's a little bit confusing, is I'm, I'm going to try to go by the groups. So, again, this is the overall map of our Caucasus. Here's our Dagestan, and this is ancient map of it, so it lists some of the ancient ethnic groups, and as we will be talking about them, I will mention which ones are mentioned in very archaic sources. Now, this is the kingdoms that formed on that, in the same region. So, this is the Kolhite that we talked about, Armenia, Iberia. Uh, Persia, and there, this is one of the possible, 
you know, boundaries of the Albanian kingdom. You see that it was quite large and it lasted quite a few centuries. It did not collapse. When was the Arabic conquest? Around seventh century. Yeah. And this is uh, this is where the first group that we're going to be talk about, the largest one of the largest groups in the region, that's the Avars group. Let now let me exit out of this. So the Avars, their totem has been wolves, bears, and particularly eagles. And now a lot of things I say about one ethnicity in Dagestan is going to apply to a lot of other ethnicities uh, because not all of them co-evolved together and very few of them are, uh, mm, it's not possible to talk about history of one uh, ethnicity without mentioning the history of all the others. So a lot of these things apply to a lot of these peoples. Um, there's a famous dance and I'll pull that up in a little bit that's called the Lesgian dance that is oftentimes applied to a lot of these people even though each time it's a different dance that is being referred to their language for this group of people and this is the avar people their language group they, they're in the nakhchi dagestani group, uh, language family they are some of the old, representative of some of the oldest um autotonic people of that region. Well, a lot of these languages are related to such languages as we talked about, the Hurites, the Urarto language groups, and also to the ancient Albanese language. There are some theories about whom they descended from. Now, you got to remember, these regions were repeatedly overran, as David has mentioned, by uh, invaders from both sides of Caucasus, from the Scythians from this side, and then from the um, Persian peoples from that side, plus Rome intervened at one point in time when Rome became a powerful thing, then later on the Byzantine Empire meddled quite a bit. Greeks, of course, early on and later on. Um, and then, of course, you had the Ottoman Empire, the Persian Empire. I mean, everybody who could and couldn't um, see that's, that's the Roman Empire, and that's the Roman Empire invading. And that's when it, yeah, when they took over that region. That's a really good map right there. There's one guess that says that they possibly either were related to the ancient Avar people, which would make sense because they're known as Avar people and Avar people were very warlike peoples uh, in our ancient world. Uh, this is Byzantium now. This is Christianity, Atlantic Abhasia. Obviously, you remember we talked about Armenia, uh, Albania. You see Albania still here. Byzantium, you know, Rome rose and fell. Uh, and only now does Albania finally disappear. That's was the Arabic conquest when the Christianity mostly gets wiped out. Now, Albania was a Christian country towards its fall, a fiercely Christian country. So one theory says that they are descendants of ancient Avars. The other theory says that they actually related to, to Casps and, and Bells, which are kind of distantly related to Gothic peoples in very archaic times. They were great, a part of the Great Albania. A lot of these tribes were. And the Great Albania included in it. It included Dagestani territory, Chechen and Angush territory, and some of the other ones. Darginia Darks we will be talking about. So you see how this little region was constantly breaking up into smaller um, they were not, sometimes they were kingdoms, some, but more often than not, they were ethnic uh, territories. And oftentimes, because this region was constantly bounded by waves and waves of invaders, these people would be forced to unite together, even if they had different, even if they had different cultural traditions, even if they had a different um, faith, they would still oftentimes fight for each other and on each other's behalf with the various invading peoples. These are peoples who have always been more, very warlike, have always kind of been extremely tolerant of each other's religion. That's another thing that I did not mention to you guys. The, the religions in this region are, you know, all versions of um, Islam, uh, plus there's small Christian population, mostly Orthodox Christian, and there's the people who have for centuries practiced Judaism, um, and that's the mountain mm -hmm. Jews. Armenian Christians. Yeah, yeah, and Armenian Christian, Armenian Christians. And from this particular peoples right here, I don't know if you ever heard of the name of uh, Imam Shamil, Imam Shamil, he's a very famous uh, Caucasian um, independence leader uh, and uh, historical character that is an absolute iconic hero to a lot of people of Caucasus, and particularly Dagestani people. He was from these people. He was from the Avars, and I thought it was necessary to mention it. Another thing that I want to mention about the Dagestani people in general is that, uh, again, there's no such nation as Dagestani. No peoples call themselves um, Dagestani. It's just, it's purely um, an administrative unit, basically. But the people there, there's a very high tradition of um, martial arts and various physical, like boxing, uh, you know, kickbox, any sort of fighting type. And a lot of what you care about is Russian champions and now, uh, you know, whether it's a UFA or any of those fighting type events, those peoples are oftentimes from Dagestan. They're renowned fighters. Also, they are a Muslim region, predominantly 90% population is Muslim, but 
the women there are not exactly uh, meek and they have known to have picked up arms and fought alongside of them many times in case of an invasion into the region. Okay, just a little on uh, Avars as, as they're known to the West and, and um, they get there uh, the middle of the seventh century, they invaded Hungary. Um, they actually conducted an alliance with the Longbeards to attack the Gidipedes, which were the um, were the Germanic tribe that come out after the after the, the Huns fell, and um, which lasted almost a century. And then the Avars apparently originated from the uh, east. Well, they definitely came from the east, but one theory is that they were the a group known as the Wan Wan. They were basically driven off the steppe, migrated way all the way to the Hungarian plain, and they would set up a kingdom there until sometime in the 700s. Uh, so uh, when you when I say Avars, it's not just one ethnicity. What we're talking about is it's about a third of the total population of current Dagestan, 30 percent. But it but the group Avars consists of 15 ethnic groups within itself. That is Andians, Arch Arachins, Ahavarts, Bagauls, Pishtins, Bakhtilitsi, and so on and so forth. There's a lot, a lot of, but then each one of these groups, there's a lot of smaller subgroups and they all have individual languages, not dialects, languages oftentimes. Um, the total population of the uh, Avarian group of people is about 1 million people. Um, plus or minus, and they, like I said, they speak the Nakhchi Dagestani Caucasian uh, language, languages. Um, they're about 30% of the population. Now, the next group I want to share with you, and it's the kind of the people after whom the Dagestan is possibly named Dargs, Dargins, uh, Dogs. I'm going to now I wanted you to see some of the images of what these people look like. Now, a lot of them have very, very similar costumes, but at the same time, they all do have their traditional and ethnic um, the cultural differences, even. So the dark people, again, they're central Dagestan people, mostly Sunni Muslims. There's about 589 thousand of them. There is some speculation that the word dark, dargo, might mean center or the heart, so they live in central Dagestan. Some theories that speculate that they uh, are results of an admixture with the Gothic or Alani or Maso Gothic peoples, Masagets. This is just a little bit of an idea of what these people look like. I mean, they're very beautiful peoples. So. Now, this is a larger group. They're about 17% of the total population of Dagestan. They mostly live in the mountains uh, in the middle part of uh, the Republic. Now, the Nogai people is about 16% of the total population, and they mostly live in the Nogai steppes in the north of Dagestan. These are fairly latecomers, and they are uh, peoples who were part of the Tataro, Mongolian of the Mongolian um, armies, under leadership of a particular military leader by the name of Nogai. And he mostly took Kipchaks and Polovets. I don't know if you know anything about these people, but if you know anything about the history of uh, early Rus, uh, early Russia, Russia and Ky uh, Kievan territories, Kievan Russia, um, the Nogai peoples um, formed basically as a kind of a breakaway part of s and ethnic groups that were originally sucked into the Mongolian army and then broke off under the leadership of one of the Mongolian commanders. And the peoples are named after his name, and that's the Nogai people. Then they speak Turk language, they mostly practice uh, their Islamic peoples, Muslim peoples, and they are mostly steppe peoples. Traditionally, these are the peoples who are um, migratory herders, just like a lot of these steppe peoples were. So, uh, they, yeah, and they're pretty late comers to the region, pretty late comers. 13th century is when they appeared and they broke off from the Kipchak's Polovets section. So, also they're known as steppe Tartars, sometimes they refer to steppe Tartars. Our next group is going to be, the next people is going to be Kumex, which is going to be very interesting group, another group. So Kumex, and I have a little presentation on them. They are exactly the case that David was talking about. They're peoples who are, on the one hand, are clearly ethnically and morphologically a part of the you know, Caucasus population. But by the same token, they are 
they speak a Turek language and they speak a particularly rare Turek language. They speak the Kipchak, all of this type of um, Turek language. Let me get back to these people. So there's been a lot of debate of who these peoples are. Some said that they may be not Turek at all and they're actually local peoples who, or, or who got converted to a different lingu linguistic group. So there's a total population of them is about uh, 500,000. But these people who have very much traditional Caucasus appearance, traditional Caucasus culture, and yet they speak uh, Turek languages and they, their origins is much debated where they came from, how they became, who they are, why do they speak the language they speak, are they a result of what mixture. So they are actually, they're also related, besides the Kipchaks, they're related to Hazars. I don't know if, if any of you know what the Hazar Kaganat is, anybody? We will talk about that when we start talking about early Rus. They converted to Judaism, or at least their elites did, in an attempt to stand off both against the Byzantine Empire and the nearby Arabic countries. And so they converted to Judaism without being Jews, but uh, they possibly have contributed to this particular population as well. So who makes about 13% of the population? And they are mostly in the uh, lower parts of Caucasus and uh, the areas that lead up to the mountains, but are not mountains yet. So these are these peoples. If, does anybody want to jump in and say anything? Because I'm dumping this information on everyone at a very kind of uh, gunfire speed. Okay. Then next one's the Lesks, Lesgin. Lesgin is what they're called in Russian, 12% of the population. They're mountainous people. And these are the people after whom the dance Lesginka is named. And I'm going to show you Lesginka real quick because that's something you have to see. Lesginka is a, basically a name for any traditional Caucasian dance, but it's named after these peoples. Uh, Lesk is what Russians called all the people of Dagestan and oftentimes all the people of North Caucasus uh, conglom kind of an umbrella term, but it's not, it wasn't originally a name of any one particular group. Okay, and Lesgink is something that is danced by both men and women. It is something that um, they said that, that when they're dancing it, men look like eagles, like from, you know, those mighty birds of the mountains, and that women look like a she-eagle uh, serenely floating over the mountain tops. The, you know, the one thing about the people of Caucasus, there's something that I don't know, good or bad, that we are losing in Europe, is that men are still very much masculine and females are very much feminine. And that cult of warrior health, warrior skills, is the ability to be noble, to present yourself. These are people who fought off waves and waves of invasions over the centuries and centuries and centuries. These are people who don't practice this for performance. These are people who are just having fun at the wedding. And that is, that's the entire Caucasus right there, right there. That's Caucasus in a nutshell. So Lesgins were deaf, very warlike people. Uh, they are in the mountains and the mountain, uh, the approaches to the mountains and uh, also lower regions of the South Dagestan. That's 12% of the population. Now the next group is Lakhs or Lakhs, Lakhs. Um, but let me get to them because they are, again, a lot of these peoples are Muslim, very few are not. There's about 161 southern of these peoples. And they are also a kind of, they were part of tribes, they descend from peoples who also um, were part of the Great Albani and they also in the Nakshi Dagestani linguistic group. Let me see uh, that I should have a video represent. I'm not like boring you guys to death yet, am I? Because I did now, enjoy the dancing please. again. That dancing was a lot like what uh, you showed in a couple of other podcasts. Right. And it's very, very impressive because if these are just people at a gathering, it's like, well, there are stunt people that would have a hard time doing that. Right. So these are the lock, lock people or locks. Um, they also, uh, you know, they're the people, they're mostly in the central part of the mountains. There's about 5% of the ethnic uh, composition of Dagestan is the Lakh people. Mm -hmm. Very beautiful women, very beautiful men. Um, also very warlike people, part of the Great Albania once upon a time. Just to give you some images, these are some historical pictures. You know, this is obviously the time of the Russian Empire. Uh, most of them are Sunni um, Muslim peoples. And by the way, uh, you know, light, light hair, blue eyes are very widespread a lot of, among a lot of these people. This is the Lux uh, image, you know, this, this is their kind of a symbol, symbol, their flag. Um, now, the next groups are going to represent about 4% of the total population each. Um, so, very important group is uh, Taba Saran. Taba Saran is one of the oldest ethnic groups in Caucasus and in North Caucasus. They, once upon a time, had their own kingdom. 
uh, for for period of time. They're very warlike peoples. They fought off almost everyone who tried to come there. They live in the South Dagestan, Dagestani mountains, and they most likely um, uh, were big, big central part of the Great Albania. And their language is considered to be one of the most complex languages in the world. They have uh, 30 different ways to... In the English language, you don't have these word forms for nouns. When you have a, a word form for like, if it's a noun does something or something is being... So if a cat is doing something or something is being done to the cat, or we, the cat was in the past, the cat was in the future. Uh, those are different uh, forms, uh, word forms of the nouns. Well, in Russian language, I believe that there are seven of those in... in uh, in the Sabaran language, there's 30 forms of it. It's considered to be one of the most complex languages in the world. This is the Sabaran people, very warlike, very archaic people of Dagestan heartland. They fought of everyone. I don't think they've ever been truly conquered. Uh, they are mostly, um, also mostly Muslim peoples. Next peoples we have here, sometimes they're called the Dagestani Jews. Um, and then uh, there's also Rutul people, Argul people, Suhar people, and so on and so forth. These peoples represent a small percentage of the total population. But there's one peoples that I did want to talk to you about, and that is the Udig peoples. And they're the oldest peoples. Um, these are the people that are believed to have been the heart population of the ancient Albania. So Albania originally had an, uh, its own linguistic, uh, its own written language. And when those, those writings were found, uh, the only way people were able to translate them. So Uber's people, their population is catastrophically small. There's only 10,000 of them. I repeat, there's 10,000 of these people. But they are some of the oldest peoples in the region, and they definitely were in the heartland. Now, peoples, if anybody from Caucasus is watching this video, I'm not an expert on Dagestan. And if I get anything wrong, please correct me in the commentary. I'll be happy to share that with everybody else. My idea is to just expose people from the Western world to these very unique, very archaic tribes, uh, groups, ethnicities, histories, and uh, cultures, populations, and languages. People in Dagestan, nations in Dagestan, um, different ethnicities in Dagestan have learned to live together and to assist each other. They've learned to have tolerance for each other, you know, different ethnic and linguistic groups, different customs from one village to another. You might have a Christian group, you might then, you know, right next to it, you might have a, a people who practice Judaism, and then next to you have Muslims of one kind, Muslims of another kind, and some in some little village, somebody might still be, they might be having some vestiges of those Austrian rituals, some uh, vestiges of the pre-monotheistic uh, rit uh, rituals. So a lot of these peoples, a lot of these na nationality, and groups are mentioned as far back as Herodotus and Strabon. Strabonus, is that how you say it? Um, it's a lot of these peoples go back in the archaic history of time for as long as we can envision. Some of these people have coexisted with the Sumerian civilization, with Urartu, before there were Persians, before there were any Greeks, before there were any Romans, before, the, of course, there were any modern Europeans. These people existed in that region. Caucasus, like a lot of mountain regions, seems to be a repository, a it place where, where people have uh, grouped together diff of different groups and stood together as basically brotherly or, you know, whatever you want to call them, sisterly, neighborly nations and groups and clans and states. And together they fought up wave of aggression after wave of aggression. With the occasional of blood. Well, and of course, I mean, they would lose because, I mean, when you have a total population of 10,000 people, I don't think you're going to be able to fight off the Roman Empire or the uh, later Persian Empire or the Russian Empire or the Ottoman Empire or any of the above or the Byzantine Empire. But nonetheless, they survived. They preserved their unique uh, linguistic and ethnic um, traditions. And I think that that's a really inspiring story for the rest of us, because if the rest of us could learn to live in peace or at least collaborate, you know, cooperate and not try to kill each other all the time, I think we'd be living in a much better world. And that's pretty much the kind of story I wanted to just tease you guys with. If anybody is interested, you can go and look a lot of the stuff up yourself. But that's pretty much all, guys. Any thoughts, comments, complaints? I sort of get the feeling um, there's so many different peoples there. and There's been so many different empires and armies over thousands of years, but they, they preserve their way of life. It seems like uh, we, you know, we don't care who the bosses are. We'll just be ourselves. <laughs> right. And almost everybody who took over them, re they rebelled and rebelled and rebelled and rebelled until whoever was the, you know, the conqueror was said, forget it. 
and took off. And the only ones who didn't say forget it and take off, of course, was the early Arabic conquest. By the way, some of the oldest um, uh, Muslim, um, gosh, some of the oldest Muslim architectural treasures of the world also are in the, the region of Dagestan. Some of the oldest mosques are there. I mean, Islam came there as early as 7th century, 700s, I believe. No, that's, yes, no, 7th century. Yes, so, or early 8th, yes. Uh, so, I mean, I, I believe it's like 763 or something like that. But uh, yeah, so the very lo long, very rich, very learned tradition of Islam in that region and very tolerant, very uh, multifaceted, uh, learned Islam. I, I have to admit, I was kind of impressed, um, not just impressed with the style of their clothing. I mean, they're very well dressed, but uh, the basic household, you know, and probably ritualistic objects that I saw in a lot of those photos, just really fantastic looking in style and presumably in manufacture. You know, today, Dagestan is a prime tourist destination for the Russian peoples um, nowadays because nobody else can get to the region now uh, due to the world events. But um, one of the things that they specialize on, they have settlements that are sp like craftsman settlements. So like there will be a settlement that is like specializes in crafting, I don't know, daggers, another settlement that specializes in uh, crafting golden vessels another settlement specializes in pottery and another settlement for example there was a, a settlement that especially because they didn't have any sort of resources around but they had a main road that's been laid by their village they became specialists in driving long distance trucks mm -hmm. i mean that became their kind of a spe special uh, their kind of uh, craft speciality in that region um, and now that uh, that became a little bit less profitable they're thinking about investing in the you know Kind of creating i mean it's it's they're very family oriented uh they're very um but by the same to token you know something that we we're going to be talking about unfortunately nathan isn't what was asked today but you know that the idea of hospitality is very very uh, key to a lot of these peoples on the one hand but on the other hand they're a little bit standoffish to strangers you gotta know somebody before you really i mean they will welcome a stranger in and like feed them and give them a place to sleep uh, but uh, you, they are cautious before they let you into their hearts, you know, before they, they will be friendly, but before, but once they let you in their hearts, these people are super hospitable, super friendly. And uh, fairly patriarchal, though there's, I, I'm very sorry, I don't remember, remember the name of the poet, but one of these peoples, there's a famous tale, they had a famous female poet in like 18th century, something like that. And the story goes like, she's a renowned poet, she was Muslim, obviously. And she was sitting on, next to a tree and she was playing a music instrument, something like a lyre and, you know, singing one of her poems and a stranger came by, a male stranger, and he did not appreciate her poetry, he made fun of it, so she beat him to death with her lyre. <laughs> So th these are the meek Muslim women for you of <laughs> Dagestan. So stories like that. Um, it sounds like an appropriate punishment. Well, yeah, I mean, I mean, there was very, despite the fact that these early on became very Muslim regions, they, they, the women here have always had quite a bit of uh, club, quite a bit of weight. And uh, probably because men oftentimes died. And uh, the idea of helping each other, I mean, there was a key, I mean, another battle uh, where, uh, oh, uh, Tamerlane, is that how you say it in English? Tam uh, in the time of the Timur, Tamerlan, whatever, however you pronounce him, you know, the great Mongolian Muslim conqueror who came to that region. By the way, they conquered them with, you know, sword and fire. Um, there was a one village that was uh, pagan, and then next to it was another village that was uh, Muslim. And uh, when the Mongols, when the forces of uh, Timur came and they went to conquer the little village that was pagan. Their neighbors, who were also Muslim, uh, they stood side by side with their pagan neighbors. I mean, and that was pretty common. It was really surprised the invaders because the invaders were Muslim and this other village was Muslim. So why are they defending their pagan neighbors? But that idea of neighbors uniting together, regardless of their faith, regardless of their ethnicity, was something that's always made Dagestan stand together, no matter who came to invade them. So, um, and like I said, a lot of sportsmen, just a real cult of sports, of physical strength, of, uh, you know, exercising, bettering yourself, of dance, of art, of um, just masculine pursuits and feminine pursuits, always been very, very um, important in that region. Here's, I think the key word here is, uh, I mean, of course, these encounters went different ways. There were times when certain groups wanted to join the Russian Empire. There were times when they desperately did not want to join the Russian Empire. And there were plenty of kidnappings and atrocities, I think, committed by any conquering um, imperial force throughout history. 
but I think part of this is, you know, and that's something the British Empire didn't seem to have to the same degree as a lot of other empires. I think I've mentioned before the definition of an empire is kind of a conglomeration of different religious, ethnic, and cultural groups that the overarching administration tries to not direct in any way, shape, or form as far as how they practice their daily life as long as they have, you know, they obey the overarching law of the governing yeah. structure. And, and pay the taxes, you know, and send and faithfully send their men to to fight the wars. So that seems to be one of the um, kind of. I mean, to, today the word empire is very much kind of vilified. But one of the things that empires oftentimes allow them, whether it's you know Roman Empire, Persian Empire, whatever, after the initial conquest, oftentimes the subjugated peoples or the peoples who join into that imperial force, um, oftentimes are allowed to co- practice their own cultural desires as long as they faithfully pay you know, into the joint taxes fund and stuff. Yeah, we, we forget how many in the Roman Empire, there were a lot of uh, neighboring countries that actually wanted to join the Roman Empire. Like if you look at the conquest of England, um, there were a lot of uh, client states or sympathetic tribes and stuff because the Romans came in, set up an administration, kind of like the Brits did later. They would set up an administration and then leave everything else alone. Right. Towards the, yeah, I, like I said, after the original conquest, yeah, period of conquest. Much, right. But that's, that's usually you have the first extension and then they do kind of tend to, and Persians did the same thing early on now until they went crazy and started enforcing, you know, militant version of Zoroastrisms everywhere, which wasn't, did not go well everywhere. But I think that, um, I don't know, there's something to be said to allow other nations and other nationalities and other ethnic groups and linguistic groups to be and not necessarily brush them with the same comb and in the same direction. So, and but, that spirit of cooperation that is actually quite inspiring, by the way, Julie. And I think the Dagestan is a, one of the very unique regions that way where I think they just fought against each other for so many centuries, so long ago that by the time that they historically appear in any historic records, they kind of learned to cooperate because what they had, we already kind of fought it out. They're all small groups. And they're very small groups. I mean, like I said, I mean, 10,000 people, but that's not even population of Salt Lake City. You know, it's not even population of, I don't know, Provo. And, um, and the, the interesting thing is these are not dying languages. These are not just dis- dis- disappearing cultures. These are ongoing, strong cultural groups. Can I, can I ask you something? Who? Cool. Uh, personally or publicly? Uh, about- Supreme Court recent. Uh, uh, yeah, so do you mind if David asks you a political question? Yes. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Okay, uh, I'm going to... Sh- Are you willing to share with us what you think about the Supreme Court's ruling, not so much on that case, but on the issue of sovereignty? Um, sovereignty comes down to your ability to live your culture but at the same time, see, I don't know too much about the decision, but it's, it's basically to me about culture. Um, but at the same time, you have uh, the members of my tribe, a lot of them have gotten what I call uh, more modernized. They think more modern, modern thinking now. So a lot of times politically, they are not almost similar to the way people think in Washington but they use the idea of sovereignty for political reasons. Reasons. Um, the, look, in case anybody doesn't know, there was a ruling where an Indian court, there was a, a crime committed and an Indian court, uh, Navajo court, Dene court, uh, gave one, one uh, sentence and then there was there was almost a case of double jeopardy was oh, cool. and picked up somewhere else, I believe. Yeah, that one there, a Navajo man committed a case of rape against a woman on a Ute, the Ute reservation. Oh, it was a Ute reservation. Yeah, and the Utes have a different judicial system. Apparently, that's left over from the the days of the pioneers. You know, like that. Right. And I guess in the in that particular case, the court gave him a lighter sentence, and then the federal government came in and says, "You know, we're going to impose a harsher sentence." So it, it's a different court system than the Navajo tribal court. 
I see. Uh, I see. That makes sense. That does make sense. I wasn't aware of that. And it, did, it didn't say anything that in the Reddit article I read either, which is weird. Yeah, it's like it's interesting here because I know in Canada we have our own sovereignty issues. For example, I live in a territory which does not have a representative uh, from Majesty the Queen. So we are not sovereign in the same way as the provinces. And yet natives here have their own self-governments. There's uh, 15 of them in Yukon. So they, they have equal powers to the territory in some way. So it's the sovereignty issues are so being worked out, I think, here. I just know it's a remnant of a, a different time period. Um, so um, I don't know how if that applies to uh, Navajo courts. But usually, in case of murder or people from outside the reservation, like Anglos, the, the, the FBI will have jurisdiction on, on those matters. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I say here, uh, most Native groups don't have their own courts exactly, but they do have sentencing circles. And the, the way the sentencing is done is quite different from the, the, the white court, I guess you call it. Um, and to a white perspective, the, 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 the punishment is not really a punishment, but it actually works to re restore the balance between the, the individual and the community. It's like trying to make restitution for the person to learn to live in the community again. And that's, that's how it's done usually. So it's a, people are now looking at this, uh, they call it circle justice. They're, they're looking at it now and they just, um, the regular courts are looking at it as well with some interest. Well, and I think there's a lot to be said about what you just said about it being more about cultural sovereignty than any kind of other sovereignty. If I may say something very politically charged here, but my impression always has been that on the one hand, yes, it's sovereign nations, you know, as far as the native people in the U.S. go. But if one of those sovereign nations, let's try, let's say, tried to make an independent treaty, let's say it was India or was Finland or something like that. I mean, I think that uh, the federal government would not stand for that at all. Am I correct? Yeah. Uh, the Hopis have tried to um, issue their own passports, you know, and yeah. the government wouldn't agree with it. Yeah. Uh, in uh, Canada, it's, it's, it's a bit different. I mean, um, say the, the natives used to be put on reservations, which was a, a separate issue. They'd be under the Indian Act. But now we have what's called self-government so that they have their, their own actual governments. And they, in fact, can do things internationally um, bypassing the federal government system. It's legal, but it's something that's not really done very often. Yeah, because I can imagine that, let's say, a treaty with Russia would cause a real problem right now. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, because they're doing uh, fishing treaties with Alaskans and things like that. And right. that's, that's happening with or without the federal government's input. Interesting. So they, 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 they can do things on their own, but they, it's, they, because they're quite small, like the local group is about 600 odd people. So yeah, they're their own government, but I mean, how much can they actually do without right. any people? They can run their own uh, schools and all sorts of things and they can tax as well, but they don't. Interesting. Well, that was an interesting kind of veer off of the discussion. Uh -huh. But it, it sort of fits in what's happening in, in Dagestan, though, because it's, it's different peoples living together, different rules and different languages. Well, exactly the same things happens here. We have different languages and different rules, and yet we're all living side by side with each other. And basically, the native system is to restore social order, is what we would say if we want to use big fancy terms. It's to, it's to restore the, the people um, and the relationships between the, you know, the bad guy and the, and the rest of the community. And, uh, and that's actually very successful. And modern courts are looking at those examples and we're, they're trying to incorporate some of those things. So we have um, justice workers up here that are looking at the native ways of doing things and they're incorporating them into the, the uh, you know, the, the crown system. Basically the, you know, the queen's of the boss and she runs everything in the, in the courts, but we're looking at how locals, you know, like people do things as well and incorporating them into the modern system. Right. And I was going to say that, for example, uh, was the, was not just Dagestani, it was Chechen people, English people, a lot of the Caucasian peoples of, of the North Caucasus. I know that like in Moscow, I mean, there's a lot of diasporas of those peoples living in Moscow there. I mean, sometimes there's a conflict because as usual, older generation will stay back home in the mountains and they will send the young people to earn money or the young people are going to want to go to the capitals and, you know, make money or have fun or whatever. And when they get out of hand, if, uh, if a good police, uh, you know, officer has connections in that region if he, if he can call in any elder and i'm talking about you know there could be chechen 
youth or Chechen young man or causing ruckus or causing a problem, he can call in somebody from Dagestani group, any elder, any family patriarch who will have a talking to with these young bandits sometimes and they will just yeah, when they call in the el- when they call in the elders you know you're in trouble they just stop it and it doesn't matter of what ethnicity the elder is what i'm getting at because that respect for your elder because you know that the elders are going to talk to each other and that's something that our society very much has lost community is the big thing and then uh going back to the local jurisdiction we're, we're experimenting with this thing called uh, uh the peace court or if there's a conflict among community members, they're supposed to talk about it and agree to take a course of action to uh, to resolve a situation. But if they don't, you know, it is non-binding. So so even though they may agree to a peace court settlement, if if, if one of the parties doesn't fulfill their obligation, then it goes up to a a, a more formal legal oh. legal court system. <laughs> so it's an at will court. All right, guys. So. We will finish the Chechen peoples and after that we will do hospitality rights and see where we're going from there. Does that sound good to everyone? Sounds yeah. good to me. Good to see everybody. Everybody it's so good to see everybody. I love the beard, Ryan. You're getting very uh, bearded. I'm playing around with it. I'm doing the mountain man look. Okay, guys. See ya. Bye. All right. Goodbye. Bye everyone. exist within every man's soul every man's and we soul. will live forever or as long as stories are told, stories are told. Stories we are the